Wild West Podcast proudly presents the third of a five-part series on the early Cheyenne Indian Wars from 1857 to the Sheridan Winter Campaign of 1868. In part three of the series, the Cheyenne Campaign of 1857, is the historical accounts of the first actual campaign against the Plains Indians, known as the Battle of Solomon Fork. This little-known clash with the Cheyenne Indians took place in northwest Kansas, near present-day Pinocchi in Graham County, Kansas. Throughout the American West, regular troops delivered state-sanctioned violence to execute United States law and policy. The mission was either to punish and terrorize Indian plundering and drive specific tribes onto legitimate reservations, or force Indians into the treaty table. Race, environment, technology, profession, and fear aggravated the pitch of violence on the frontier battlefield. Before the Whites' arrival, the only boundaries recognized by the Cheyennes were those imposed by their limited means. The Cheyennes' rights were expansion and their enforcement by might over other tribes. They hunted buffalo within their boundaries and frequently raided across the borders against their enemies to steal horses and gain honor. The Cheyenne did not comprehend how the overpowering wave of white migration moving onto their lands would eventually force upon them fixed boundaries across which the white man would tolerate no raiding. Nevertheless, the Cheyenne way of life had produced a healthy and productive society, an enviable culture that they were determined to retain. These brave and proud people would not be compelled to accept the white man's changes upon their lifestyle without a fight. The United States government anticipated that the increasing influx of immigrants moving across the Great Plains through Cheyenne land would eventually lead to conflict. The U.S. government attempted to forestall problems with the Cheyenne through negotiation. Those negotiations led to the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. The treaty's goal was to avoid confrontation by moving the Cheyenne away from the white settlements and immigrant trails. The treaty set aside land in northern Colorado for the Cheyenne. Initially, it was successful in promoting peace between the two cultures. Even so, increased traffic along the Kansas and Nebraska overland migration routes prompted Cheyenne raids against the immigrants in the spring of 1856. The army struck back against the Indians, which in turn resulted in more Cheyenne retaliatory raids against the wagon trains that summer. The attacks slowed with the onset of fall when the Cheyenne bands came together for their winter camp near the junction of the Solomon and Smoky Hill Rivers. But Secretary of War Jefferson Davis wanted the Cheyenne punished and authorized Colonel Edwin V. Bull Sumner to conduct a punitive campaign in the winter of 1856-1857. Several hundred regular troops crossed challenging terrain in every western department, searched for the Indians, and struck devastating blows. The success of these scouts in force was tied directly to the commanding officer, who personally led the brigade into the field and into combat. These ambitious men linked the destiny of their civilization, nation, race, regiment, and themselves to their victories in battle with the Indians. In the Frontier Army, professional soldiers earned distinction through exploration or combat, and the majority of officers embraced combat opportunities for battle glory might later translate into professional advancement. Frontier campaigns were a battery of physical punishments and natural hazards. The best commanders skillfully managed their men and animals to minimize their loss to exposure, exhaustion, and accident. Successful combat officers utilized environment, technology, surprise, and aggression to terrorize, destroy, and defeat their Indian enemy. The following is an account of Robert E. Peck, who served in the 1st Cavalry Division during the Battle of Solomon Fork. My name is Robert E. Peck. At the age of 17, I became inspired by the promise of Western adventure. With this inspiration, I decided to abandon my printer's apprenticeship in Covington, Kentucky. 
so I enlisted in the U.S. Army's 1st Cavalry Regiment. Upon my enlistment, I was assigned to Company E and trained and drilled at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri during the winter of 1856-57. When the Missouri River ice broke, the other recruits and I steamed upstream to the 1st Cavalry Headquarters at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. I remember my first trip up the Missouri River and how cold it was during the winter months. The water that had run so freely in the fall was now trapped in icy form. It was when our steamboat landed along the Kansas shoreline that I noticed how the icicles dangled from the shadowy skeletons of trees, each one like an ominous sword of Damocles. The river, almost frozen solid, was covered with broken ice so thick that it showed reflections as clear as a mirror of the heavy gray sky. The chill breeze slicing through the air seemed to whisper ice. Fort Leavenworth was the first permanent United States Army fort established in Kansas. Colonel Henry Leavenworth founded it in 1827. The Fort of Missouri served as a central unit in the system of frontier defense. It primarily served as a general depot from which supplies were sent to all the United States military camps and forts in the Great West. Here, the military commanders of the Department of Missouri made their headquarters. At Fort Leavenworth, I first received my standard issue of riding gear and my horse from our quartermaster. Our horses were bought from ranchers and civilian breeders. So I was issued a solid-colored Mustang mare. The cavalry preferred solid-colored horses and assigned them by color so that a regiment would have a bay company, a sorrel company, and a chestnut company. A three-inch letter U.S. was hot-branded on my new horse's left shoulders. We were told that our cavalry unit's efficiency depended entirely upon the condition of the horses, which alone makes them able to get over long distances in short spaces of time. Therefore, the horses must be nursed with great care so that they may endure the utmost fatigue when emergencies demand it. Our staff sergeant told us during our training that everything must be done for the comfort of the horse. Fort Leavenworth was laid out with a dusty parade ground bordered by the officers' quarters on one side and barracks for the other enlisted men. Behind the barracks were stables and corrals for the horses. The stables were built from stone. Each stall had a window, a manger, and straw bedding on a natural base. When not in use, our horses spent the day outdoors on a picket line or grazing under guard. Reveille sounded at 5.30 a.m., followed by breakfast and one and a half hours of stable call when we watered, groomed, and fed our horses. Mounted drill occurred from 8 to 10.30 a.m., with stable call again at 4 p.m. On an average day when not on campaign, cavalrymen spent approximately five hours caring for and riding our mounts. Twice a day we led our horse to the picket line and groomed them using a curry comb, brush, hay wisp, sponge, and cloth. We were trained to sponge the horse's eyes and nostrils, comb their tails, and pick their hooves. We were issued, for our campaign, a small pouch containing a curry comb and brush for touch-ups. During my time at Leavenworth, the Indians became fed up with white intruders in their Central Plains homeland. The Cheyennes began skirmishing with traffic on the Platte River Road during the summer of 1856. In August, a retaliatory scout of 1st Cavalry had killed six Cheyennes on Grand Island in the Platte River. The Cheyenne retaliated by assaulting an immigrant camp, killing two men and an infant and abducting the mother. A full-scale war was engaged. Our command under Edwin Vose Sumner received orders from Army headquarters to activate operations against the hostile Indians. The order came in the spring of 1857. General-in-Chief Winfield Scott ordered Colonel Sumner into the Central Plains to treat with harshness or chastise the Cheyennes. Enthralled with combat, Sumner was for fighting. Like most men, I idolized our colonel, emulated his taste and aggressiveness, and proudly rode behind him. Edwin Vose Sumner was known about the regiment as Bullhead. He, being from Boston, Massachusetts, was noted as a career military man. 
His nickname, Bullhead, came from a legend that a musket ball once bounced off his head. I was proud to serve under the colonel who commanded the troops at Fort Leavenworth. Our command pulled out of Fort Leavenworth on May 18, 1857, with a force of about 500 men to subdue the Cheyenne Indians. Our mission, the Cheyenne Expedition, proceeded toward Indian country in two separate battalions. <music> Colonel Sumner divided his command into two columns. Major John Sedgwick led our one column from Fort Leavenworth, proceeding westward over the Santa Fe Trail, then northward to the South Platte River. Under Major John Sedgwick, the second column had two squadrons of the 1st Cavalry. Both of these columns contained a section of mounted howitzers. Lieutenant Colonel Joseph E. Johnston commanded the third column. Under his direct command, Sumner's central column consisted of two squadrons of the 1st Cavalry, one of the 2nd Dragoons, and four 6th Infantry Companies. Our Company E was one of four 1st Cavalry Companies that marched down the Santa Fe Trail toward the upper Arkansas River under Major John Sedgwick. His instructions were to hold no intercourse with the Cheyennes along the route until the arrival of Sumner. The Colonel explained, We do not go upon the plains this year to coax Indians, but to teach them that their depredations must cease once and forever. A day's march averaged 20 miles, usually at a walk. Cook recommends periods of trotting with frequent stops to feed and water the horses, allowing them to graze on even the shortest breaks. During ordinary marches, he added, the soldiers should dismount and lead their horses every third hour. Notes in officers' journals show that they made a point of seeking campsites with clean water and plenty of grass. During our arduous journey across the plains, the open fields became rich in buffalo grass. It was when we approached the Arkansas River that I noticed how the color of the fodder changed. The early morning pinkish rays of the sun colored the grass with a grayish tint. Yet in the yellow mid-morning sun, the grass turned a brilliant green, and at noon, bluish cast. The intense afternoon sun, the blades lost their character and through the green showed a distinct cast of yellow, so that when a light breeze whipped across, a living color seemed to run through the grass to disappear and reappear from moment to moment. In the evening, after the sun had gone down, the grass took on a purplish hue, as if it absorbed all the light from the sky and would not give it back. As our column closed on the bend of the river, the buffalo signs became more frequent. Several times they passed over packed trails left by great herds that went down to the river for water. This was when our scout alerted us to blackness that moved on the valley below us. The scout strained his eyes. At the edges of the patch there was a slight ripple. The patch itself throbbed like a significant body of water moved by obscure currents. Though it appeared small at this distance, the patch was guessed to be more than a mile in length and nearly half mile in width. Buffalo, whispered the scout. My God, said Sedgwick, how many are there? Two, three thousand maybe, replied the scout. Maybe more. This river valley winds in and out of these ravines. We can just see a little part of it from here, announced the scout. No telling what we will find further on. For several moments, the mounted scout stood beside Sedgwick and watched the buffalo herd. After hearing the scout's announcement, I looked down into the valley. At the distance from which I viewed, I could make out no shape, or distinguish no animal from another. From the north, a calm wind began to rise as it came across the landscape. Sedgwick shivered. The sun had fallen far below the valley opposite us, and its shadow darkened the place where the buffalo stood. I never imagined my first combat would be with bison, the North American buffalo. As our column approached the big bend of the Arkansas River, a massive haired buffalo began thundering across the plains. These buffalo headed towards Sedgwick's strung out cavalry and wagon train. As an artilleryman, the Major was brevetted twice for bravery in the Mexican-American War. However, he froze before the shaggy brown tidal wave some two miles out, churning and spilling towards his command. The thundering charge of the buffalo seemed to crack the air, as if the very heavens might split apart. It rolled like the ash cloud of a volcano, 
becoming a rolling, booming rumble. The buffalo herd had declared to all the raw power of nature and gave fair warnings of the wrath that was to come. The thunderous noises engulfed me, completely capturing my brain, rendering any logical thought or conclusion impossible. My captain, Samuel D. Sturgis, had survived these stampedes before. Gingerly taking over, he ordered the wagon circled, teams, cattle, and horses corralled, and the regulars deployed into a wedge. At Sturgis' command, the troopers poured on a withering fire to part the squalling brown flood. The acrid smell of stale gunpowder enveloped my nasal cavities as the buffalo stampede split into two separate herds. A solid half hour and several thousand rounds later, the bison sea had passed. Resuming command, the grateful Sedgwick led his battalion along the Arkansas to Fountain Key Bull Creek near the Rockies, where the column turned north. On July 3rd, our company of troops came to a rest on the South Platte Riverbanks to await Sumner's column. Once in camp, our horses were picketed and allowed to graze. Because there were reports of hostile tribes in the area, our unit formed the supply wagons into a corral and we tied our horses inside. Our column of troopers cut grass and bundled it in blankets and carried them back to the horses. As the sun went down, our column rested among many campfires. The campfires became bright and vivid, as though someone had shown a spotlight on us. The intensity and excitement of the flames was like they were dancing in the moonlight. The nearby river had a reflection of a distant glow, like a bright sun on land. The colors were brilliant reds, oranges, and faint yellows. It was during this time our column learned about Colonel Sumner and two companies of 1st Cavalry who left Leavenworth on May 20th. We were told that Sumner arrived at Fort Kearney and hired Pawnee scouts and attached two 2nd Dragoon companies to his force. Taking the Platte River Road, his battalion pulled into Fort Laramie on June 22nd. Five days later, leaving behind the Dragoons, but augmented by three companies of 6th Infantry, his column struck out southward, rendezvoused with Sedgwick's command, and established Camp Buchanan a few miles west of Kiowa Creek on the South Platte River. Sumner planned to cut loose from his wagon train and march southeastward toward the Republican River, the heart of the Cheyenne homeland. This was the news we had all been waiting for, the news that a battle was close at hand. A few days later, our column bivouacked at Camp Buchanan, there, my comrades and I prepared horses and tack, mules and packs, and kits and weapons for Sumner's bold strike. The colonel's scout and force included six 1st Cavalry and three 6th Infantry companies, including four prairie howitzers. Our scouts and force was also manned with a crew of Delaware and Pawnee scouts, mule train, a remuda of horses, and beef herd. To preserve our horses and the weight we carried, we were ordered to strip our clothes, saddle blankets, and weapons. Sumner's headquarters and the hospital carried one rainfly tent each. The mule train packed ammunition and 20 days' rations. Casting off from the wagons, the Cheyenne expedition snaked eastward along the South Platte River on July 13th. Bull Sumner intended to dog the Cheyennes into battle all summer long if necessary. Four days later, his expedition three columns arrayed in echelon, left behind the South Platte drainage and coursed southeast toward the Republican River. The landscape was primarily a short grass plains country that was somewhat broken and almost entirely treeless. Our scouts screened the advance and flanks at a distance of 10 to 12 miles. Their information was that a large Cheyenne village had stood on Beaver Creek as late as May. The hunt was fatiguing and tedious until three weeks into July, the regulars crossed the South Fork of the Republican. Pursuing a wide, fresh trail, our unit passed through the sites of three abandoned villages and one Sundance village before encamping at Bow Creek between the North and South Forks of the Solomon River on July 28th. The following day, still tracking southeastward, our Cheyenne expedition entered into South Fork drainage. Later that morning, one of the trackers bumped into Cheyenne scouts who slowly retreated toward the east. Anxious to hit the Cheyennes before they fled, Sumner immediately readied our 1st Cavalry to give chase. 
At Sumner's command, we dismounted, tightened up saddle girths, and examined arms and equipment to see that everything was in fighting order. Once ordered to mount, I looked over to see Sumner sitting astride his cavalry mount. The white-headed, white-bearded Sumner harangued everyone to obey orders, pull together, and proclaimed, We can whip the whole tribe. I thought to myself, Today the men and officers would learn whether his epithet bull cannot at his booming parade ground voice, thick forehead, and fighting temper. Sumner had no clear idea of how many Cheyennes awaited the 1st Cavalry in the Solomon River Valley. However, he probably figured that his regulars' discipline and firepower would offset any Cheyenne numerical advantage. Glory and death came to the frontier soldier who struck quickly and hard, and Bull Sumner had come to fight. He put in motion his six companies of cavalry, followed by the artillery and the mule train. A few minutes later, Sumner's bugler sounded trot. The infantry dropped behind, and the howitzers soon sank into a stream bed. The first cavalry and the pack train jogged onward. Sumner's column descended from the upland prairie to the Solomon River bottom. The river is a symbol of how far we've come. The river was now a sleeping cobra. It lies across the land in smooth, seductive curves, beautiful in the late morning light, cool and innocuous. Yet the river bottom held a myriad of danger as our unit of 300 regulars moved eastward along the north bank. Our unit formed three parallel columns and crossed in single file at a narrow split between the rocky point and the river. It was now approximately 1 p.m. at the far end of a broad plain extending two and one-half miles and crowned with a few cottonwoods. A small army of Cheyenne Indians mounted up, spread across the valley in a jagged line and loped toward the regulars. Through their field glasses, Sumner and his officers realized that the Cheyennes had suckered the bluecoats onto the ground of their choosing. The colonel grimly bellowed, "'Front into the line!' His right sat on the river, and his left grazed the bluff. By God, he had his fight. Cheyenne, being confident that they could defeat the soldiers, boldly lined up along the Solomon River, blocking the army's advance. Sumner estimated their numbers at 300 to 350 warriors. The Indians were all mounted and well-armed. Many of them had rifles and revolvers, and they stood with remarkable boldness. Sumner, with his 300 troops, was equally confident of success. Going into battle without the infantry seemed a little reckless to me and my comrades, but Colonel Sumner, a 38-year veteran, cautiously approached the Cheyennes. I looked over to the other side of the riverbank and saw many Cheyennes painted and dressed for war. The Cheyennes eerily warbled their death songs and gesticulated with shields, spears, bows, muskets, rifles, and pistols. This sight astonished me. The Cheyenne war party seemed 900 to 1,000 keen, but Sumner's more sober calculation was approximately 300. Bull Sumner would not balk at fighting 15 score Cheyenne. Riding at the point, he ordered the march and then the trot. It was as if Sumner said to himself, I see you in the shadows of my mind. I see the calculation behind every move you make. You are a technician of a chess player, but so am I. With my cavalry, I will invoke fear in so many, using your position to my advantage. I understand you. The fear you once reigned over me is ebbing, not yet fully under control, but reducing little by little. I won't back down. I won't run or turn tail. There is a weakness in the way you posture, and it will prove your Achilles' heel. When within rifle range... Chief Scout Fallleaf dashed out front to fire his weapon. Several Cheyenne rounds chased him back. Swelled with pleasure, Sumner declared to the young officer riding next to him, Bear witness, Lieutenant Stanley, that an Indian fired the first shot. Nervously clutching our carbines and rifles, our unit of regulars quietly swept forward in an unbroken line toward the commuting Cheyennes. Without halting, Sumner's wing companies momentarily detached to drive in enemy flankers, while the center, silent and tense, trotted onward. A short moment later, Sumner bellowed, Draw saber! Charge!
The thundering of hooves split the silence as our horses galloped through the bleak landscape. The wind whisked into the manes of my horse like flames. I could feel each muscle ripple from under my horse's freshly groomed pelt and powerful legs. They propelled us forward and kept us going as horse and soldier powered over the land. The horses we rode over the riverbank carried us onward into a full charge for battle. To see a battle approaching from horseback is a privilege, one we owe thanks for to our four-hoofed brethren. The order irritated our officers. The ring and flash of sharpened steel startled the Cheyennes. Their long, beautiful bonnets trailing behind, war leaders darted up and down the line and urged their warriors to fight manfully. However, their prepared battle medicine only protected them from bullets, not sabers. The edge steel bearing down on them, terrifying for both attackers and defender, completely rattled the Indians. Sumner's calculations were a mystery to everyone. First, cavalry firepower was formidable and lethal. From company to company, the regiment carried the most modern small arms, Springfield rifled carbines, Merrill breech-loading carbines, and Springfield pistol carbines. The first sidearm was the Colt's Navy revolver, and everyone had the saber. Recruited and organized in 1855, the 1st Cavalry had suppressed political riot and guerrilla atrocities, hardly combat trained, in bleeding Kansas during most of 1856. Officers and men expected to stagger the Cheyennes with volley of small arms fire. At a hundred yards in closing, however, Colonel Sumner, the old man to his men, and an old fogey to some junior officers, suddenly roared, Sling Carbine, followed by Gallop March. Four Leaf, a Delaware Indian, and myself got over the creek before anyone else. That is when I saw and commenced firing at three or four Indians. One or two of them got away. Two of the Indians stopped during their flight and returned to fight. One of the Indians was the chief, said Leaf. There were several, perhaps eight or ten Indians in my immediate neighborhood when I first got across the creek. All the Indians but three cleared out. I shot eight times at those remaining three Indians, but I don't think I hit but one of them, and that was not the fatal shot. One old fellow Indian gave Four Leaf and myself a parting salute before he left. The parting Indian shot at us with blunderbuss from about 20 yards. The blunderbuss looked like an old-fashioned carbine. Four Leaf and I were right together when he shot, but he missed us both. Taylor, a private in E Company, ran up very gallantly on an Indian when his horse fell and he went over the horse's head. The Indian went after him with his tomahawk. I watched with amazement as the Indian struck first with his tomahawk while Taylor avoided the blow, just missing his skull. Then suddenly Taylor slammed into the Indian's face while the Indian sunk into Taylor's stomach. Taylor and the Indian stumbled apart for a brief second to catch their breaths before driving back at each other. Taylor's eyes narrowed in determination. While Taylor dodged the Indian's first blow, he took a second blow to his forehead. Taylor shook off the blow to his head, stepped back, fell to the ground while evading a wild swing. Is that all you got? crowed Taylor as he smirked infuriatingly at the Indian. After receiving a slight wound in the forehead, Taylor got up, struck the Indian over the head two or three times, downed him, pulled his saber, and then ran the Indian through. Blood pooled in the Indian's mouth as Taylor gagged. By the time we'd finished these two or three Indians, all the rest had vamoosed. So we mounted our horses and chased the escaping Indians five or six miles beyond the creek, but could not catch them. The colonel came up pretty soon after our encounter, and we marched on to where Lieutenant Stewart, J.E.B. Stewart, was wounded. Lieutenant Stewart and several others were after about 50 Indians, but could not catch but one. First, Lieutenant J.E.B. Stewart later disbarged the saber charge as a last resort. He had wanted to wade into Cheyenne ranks and blaze away with pistols. Maybe Stewart was that rare human, the natural-born killer. Ironically, during the frantic pursuit, he rode down and nearly decapitated a warrior with a single saber blow, saving the life of Lieutenant Stanley. Wounded by a pistol ball in the chest, the gallant Stewart finished the Cheyenne expedition in a mule litter. However, Stuart was correct in his tactical sense. A small arms fire would have produced more Cheyenne casualties. 
the Indian ponies were fresh and fleet, while the cavalry mounts, working since early morning, were too worn out to overtake many of them. The story of Stuart's connection with this campaign is best given in his own words. The following letter was written at intervals on the two days succeeding the battle. Camp on Solomon's Fork, July 8, 1857 My darling wife, Yesterday, after 17 days' steady march from Camp Buchanan, we overtook about 300 Cheyenne warriors dressed up in line of battle and marching boldly and steadily towards us. We fronted into line as soon as possible, the six companies of cavalry, the infantry being too far behind to take any part in the action. Also Bayard's battery, which the colonel stopped three or four miles back, as unable to keep up. It was my intention, and I believe that of most of the company commanders, to give a carbine volley and then charge with drawn pistols, and use the saber as a dernier result. But much to my surprise, the colonel ordered, draw sabers, charge, when the Indians were within gunshot. We set up a terrific yell which scattered the Cheyennes in disorderly flight, and we kept up the charge in pursuit. I led off Company G right after the main body, but very few of the company horses were fleet enough, after the march, beside my own brave Dan, to keep in reach of the Indians mounted on fresh ponies. My part of the chase led towards the right and front, and in that direction, companies G, H, and D were in a short time mixed together in the pursuit, so that Stanley, McIntyre, McIntosh, Lomax, and myself were for the greater part of the time near each other, and frequently side by side. As long as Dan held out, I was foremost, but after a chase of five miles, he failed, and I had to mount the horse of a private. When I overtook the rear of the enemy, I found Lomax in imminent danger from an Indian, who was on foot and in the act of shooting him. I rushed to their queue and succeeded in wounding the Indian in his thigh. He fired at me in return with Allen's revolver, but missed. About this time, I observed Stanley and McIntyre close by. The former said, Wait, I'll fetch him. He dismounted to aim deliberately, but in dismounting, accidentally discharged his last load. Upon him, the Indian now advanced with his revolver pointed. I could not stand that, but drawing my saber, rushed upon the monster and inflicted a severe wound on his head. At the same moment, he fired his last barrel within a foot of me, the ball taking effect in the center of the breast, but by the mercy of God glanced to the left, lodging near my left nipple, but so far inside that it cannot be felt. I rejoice to inform you that the wound is not regarded as dangerous, though I may be confined to my bed for weeks. I am now enjoying excellent health in every other respect. I was able to dismount and lie down, before which the Indian, having discharged his last load, was dispatched by McIntyre and a man of Company D. Lomax, who came to my relief, had some sabers stuck into the ground, and a blanket put up for shade. Dr. Brewer was sent for, but as it was eight miles to the place where the fight began, there was a great delay. In the meantime, the rally was sounded, and numbers collected around me, doing everything in their power for my comfort. Soon the colonel appeared, moving up to the head of the column from the rear. He greeted me in the most affectionate terms, and had me taken on a blanket back towards the first scene of action where he intended to camp, as his horses were much too used up to continue the pursuit. I was carried in the blanket about three miles when I met the doctor who examined the wound, bandaged it, etc. Soon after, I met the sick wagon, which consisted of two hind wheels of the ambulance with a tongue attached, the cushions being fastened on the spring. The rest of the ambulance had broken down weeks ago and had been left behind. Three mules hitched to this bore me off, as it were, in a car of triumph. I suffered much from this mode of transportation, but now, July 31st, feel pretty well, though I am entirely helpless as regards locomotion. The colonel, after resting one day to bury Privates Cade of Company G and Lynch of Company A and to recuperate the horses, starts this morning on the chase. Captain Foote's company, Dr. Covey, and Lieutenant McCleary are left here with myself and the other wounded and sick. I have every reason to believe that I will be able to resume duty in about ten days or two weeks. I have received every attention from my fellow officers, 
for which I shall ever be grateful. I send this by Colburn, in case an express is sent in by Colonel Sumner before his return here. We will, in a day or two, be reduced to fresh beef alone. The regiment will return to Leavenworth, I think, certainly before the 1st of November. See Mrs. McIntyre and tell her all left in fine spirits.